Houghton. Uh, I also go by Faith. So, um, you know, you're, you're welcome to call me as you will. And I am excited to talk to you today about words of knowledge, lifestyle as a Christian, and how to journey with the Lord in a way that is fulfilling. And I am sitting here and I'm, I'm thinking about how uh, there was one day when Trina and I went to uh, eat with uh, some good friends and the man who had actually been the director of a well-known ministry school asked me, what's your life message? And I said, I don't actually really have one. Um, for the most part, when I go somewhere to speak, I will do three Bible dips where I just kind of open the Bible, what seems randomly, see what the Lord highlights, and then I let him weave those three things together, and that's what I talk about. And he said, wow, I don't think I could really do that. And I thought, I don't really feel I could do it any other way. And the reason why is because I have really chosen um, as my kind of marching orders, uh, the scripture that I spoke about in the last section, and it's in Matthew chapter 10, I believe. And it talks about how um, we are to not worry about what it is we're going to say when we go in front of the judge. And quite frankly, I interpret that in a slightly different way. Um, anyone who I am sharing a message with is going to judge the veracity of that message. They're going to decide whether or not they believe what I'm saying is truth. Um, they're going to decide whether or not they are going to receive what I'm sharing into their heart. And, and they're also going to decide whether they realize it or not. They're going to decide whether or not they're going to allow the words that I share to transform their heart. And so I really try to have my antenna up in heaven and see what the Lord wants to say versus what I might want to say. Because quite frankly, anything that I would want to say is not going to really help you out in life. Um, <laughs> it's just the way it is. So anyway, um, so yes, yeah, so, so it says um, in Matthew 10, 19, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speaks, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Well, that's a great promise. I love that promise. And so in keeping with that fine tradition, I am going to just talk to you today about integrity and how is it that we can effectively partner with the Lord in order to bring forth his plan in our lives. Um, there's a great scripture and it says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are made new. Well, that's great. That means I don't have to be the guy I was when the Lord actually pulled me out of the pit. I don't have to be that guy. I don't have to have all of those reactions I can choose today to allow him to transform me as I renew my mind. Well, how do I renew my mind? I need to get his word inside of me. I need to actually become at one with his word. And the way to do that is what I call mining the Bible for scriptural throwing stars. Um, there was a time in my life when I, I used to smoke cigarettes and I was trying to quit smoking cigarettes. And the problem is that the more you focus on something, the more you give it your attention and the greater a hold it has on you. So the more you try to think about not smoking, the more you want to smoke. Or for people who are trying to um, take care of their temple, their body, 
the more you think about dieting, the harder it is to not want to go and eat that snack. Um, so it's very clear that the things that we give our focus to, we empower in our lives. So what I learned was this, when I was trying to quit smoking cigarettes, the only way I defeated that temptation was by launching scripture at it. And so what I did was I mined the Bible for some scriptures that I could throw right at that thing. The same exact way that Jesus defeated Satan when he was being tempted in the wilderness. He, he won that battle by launching the word at it. He launched scripture at it. Because why? Because God's word never returns void. That which it's sent for, it performs. So when I would have a momentary thought about smoking a cigarette, I would say, nope. Greater is he who's in me, Jesus Christ, in my heart, than he who's in the world. And that would be the, the cigarette. Another thing that you can do is you can close your eyes and you can try to imagine the thing that you want in front of you standing right next to Jesus. And when you do that, what would you reach for? Well, that brings it right into today. I would reach for Jesus. You know, that's real simple. And, and so the other, uh, another great scripture is, um, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. Um, you know, and, and so those are some of the scriptural throwing stars. So it's important to get in the word, get into the Bible so that it can get into you. And as it gets into you, it will transform you. Um, that's kind of one way that we can enter into receiving the fullness of the scripture of second Corinthians five seventeen, which is if any man be in Christ, He's a new creation and all things are made new. So when you consider that scripture, that means that even though I used to have habits before, I don't have to be a slave to them anymore. Okay? All things are made new. Or even though I used to have emotional reactions to people, I don't have to do that anymore. So if I start to feel angry, I can say, no, I refuse to receive that. And I can instead say, I refuse to partner with it. I reject it. I send it straight to the foot of the cross for Jesus Christ of Nazareth to deal with. And instead I choose to be wrapped in peace. I choose to be the new creation, which he has made me to be. Well, take it to the next step, healing. If I'm walking along and I have a pain in my ankle, I can, I have a choice. Do I say, oh, that's my ankle and own it? Or do I say, uh, -uh. if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, all things are made new. This is not a good gift. I don't have to receive it. I can send it straight back to the one who sent it because Father God is the giver of all good gifts and Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's trying to steal from me. So I can send it back and I can say, ah, well, Lord, thank you for reminding me to pray for other people who have problems with their ankles. In fact, when the enemy comes to steal in the night, he and he's apprehended, he has to make a sevenfold repayment of that which he tried to steal. So Jesus, I'm going to ask you to go into the heart of the enemy camp and find seven people who have that pain, seven people who have been afflicted, seven people who are covered in shame, seven people who don't know you yet, seven people who have no hope, seven people who have no joy, and seven people who have no peace. And I'm going to ask you, Jesus, to reveal yourself to them so that they would see you standing there and they would know the truth 
and the truth would set them free in Jesus' name. All 49 of those people. Yeah. So that's the way to do it. And the reason why that's the way to do it is because that's what allows us to step into the new creation. And that's also what's going to show Satan that I'm not falling for your stuff anymore. And I'm choosing to partner with the kingdom and bring forth the kingdom in my life. And, and in fact, the next few meetings I go to, I'm going to give a word of knowledge. Hey, is there anybody here who has a pain in their ankle? Is there anybody here who experiences anger and has a problem letting go of it? Is there anybody here who is completely surrounded by turmoil? All of those things, those aren't supposed to be the way that we live our lives. Jesus paid a greater price for us than that. And so sometimes we don't realize and we haven't been taught that when you're born again, you have a brand new spirit and you're very sensitive. And sometimes what you're experiencing isn't yours at all. It's something on the outside trying to fool its way in, or it's something that is prevalent in that area, or it could be that you're standing next to somebody who has that issue. And so I try to look around and see what's going on. So if I happen to see somebody, the first person I look at, I'll go up to them. And I used to, you know, before I started doing this, I used to be real hesitant. And the Lord spoke to me one day and he's like, what, what are you worried about? And I said, oh, what are they going to think of me? And he said, when are you ever going to see them again? And I thought, wow, well, you know, probably not here in the land of the living. And, and when I see them in heaven, they'll be pretty happy that I spoke to them. So it's a win-win. So I got over myself and my fear of man and I partnered with heaven. And what he showed me was if I go up to that person and I say, hey, this may sound crazy, but when I looked at you, I felt as if that gives me enough time to fine tune my antenna in heaven and he will fill my mouth. And the beauty of starting that way is that I no longer have to worry about them thinking I'm crazy because I just told them I was. So that simplifies my life and that allows his kingdom to come forth because I'm no longer in my own way. So now, once I say something like that, they may say, no, don't have that problem. In which case, I, I'm not going to let Satan win. What I then say is, oh, well, the reason why I asked was because as I was walking towards you, I felt like I heard the Lord say, or I felt a pain in my knee and I don't have a pain in my knee. And so I know that that's the Lord showing me that there's somebody I'm going to encounter who does have a pain in their knee. And if that was you, it wouldn't be right of me to just walk on past. Now, would it? And they say, no, well, that's awesome because you know what just happened there? They came into agreement with the truth. And the truth is God exists, God speaks, and God wants to heal. And there's somebody on earth who is just crazy enough to risk looking foolish so that the Lord can touch them. Well, that's a win all around. Now, on the chance that they say, yes, how did you know? Well, you can explain it and say, well, I didn't feel, you know, I don't have that pain, but I know that the Lord speaks and he was showing me that he wants to heal you. So what's your name? Oh, okay, Johnny. Well, thank you, Johnny, for um, the way that you are listening and opening your heart to receive what the Lord has for you. Be healed in Jesus name. Boom. We're done. And then another thing that I can you can do is you can say, could I pray a blessing over you? And then you just give them a really short blessing. Lord, I thank you for this one's heart. I thank you for the way they are growing closer to you every day. 
I ask that you would give them many divine appointments and that you would pour out on them from heaven and they would receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. It's simple. Now, if, if you get the really distinct wave off where they're like, nope, don't want to talk to you, not interested, you say, okay, be blessed. And you just walk away. You know, because there is free will and people do have the right to choose. And so we want to be respectful and we want people to feel better for having met us. Because most people who've had bad experiences with religion aren't expecting someone who is a Christian to just give up easily. So when you say, oh, okay, all right, that's great, you know, be blessed, and you just leave, that's going to start them thinking. They're going to be like, you know, that was different. What's going on there? You know? And and that's, that's a win, too, because a seed is still planted. So <clears throat> those are some of the things that I've learned over time, doing street ministry and just, you know, being willing to be crazy for his kingdom. Um, so I, I want to um, also highlight this, that a word of knowledge is, it's basically something that there's no way that you would have known on your own, okay? And so the Lord has given it to you. Now, it could be concerning someone having an ache or pain or a sickness or um, an emotional challenge, or it could even be as you um, journey with the Lord, he may start letting you know um, some really interesting stuff about people. And you have to learn how to be sensitive because, you know, if, if he has you talking to somebody at Starbucks who's working, there, you have to be sensitive to the fact that they're at work and they, they probably don't want to get in trouble. And so you just have to um, partner with him. Don't be so set on getting your goal accomplished. You have to allow him to direct you. And that's why I believe it's very important to not worry about what you're going to say ahead of time, but instead let him speak through you. Because that way you know that his plan is going to come forth. It may not come forth today, but it will come forth. And so you have to place your faith in him. You put your trust in him. And it's going to be great. So um, having said that, I want to talk to you about one of my favorite parables. And that parable says... The kingdom of heaven is like a man who finds a treasure in a field. And that treasure is worth such value to him that he hides it and he goes and he sells everything he has so that he can buy the entire field. Well, when I consider that, one of the things that the Lord showed me is that he looked down and he saw man stuck in the world. And so he gave up his greatest possession and that was his own son so that he could redeem that whole world. And that's what God did through Jesus on the cross. Well, the Bible also tells us that, <clears throat> um, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search out a matter. And that's in Proverbs, I think it's uh, 25 to, um, you'll have to look for that one. But anyway, <laughs> that's your homework right there. Um, <clears throat> so it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to seek it out. Well, then the Bible tells us in Corinthians, it says that we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Well, now consider there's a field with treasure in it. That's dirt, right? Dirt field, treasure in it. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We are earthen vessels. So we have a treasure in us. And it's the glory of God to conceal that treasure 
and the glory of kings to search it out. So what that tells me is that we've been given this glorious opportunity to search out the treasure in others. And the way that we do that is we ask the Lord to show us how he sees them. So when he shows you something, it needs to be positive and uplifting and encouraging. If he shows you something negative about that person, flip it and flip it good. For instance, one day he showed me this person standing way out in a field all by themselves. So instead of saying, hey man, you're way off track, you're all out there on your own, I didn't say that. I said instead, God couldn't be more pleased as to how you're growing closer to him every day. And you know what that person said? They said, yeah, I'm really excited. I just started learning about the Lord last week. And I'm just, I feel like I'm growing closer every day. You're right. Well, the key is ask the Lord, Lord, what are you showing me? And what do you want me to say? Uh, or another way to think of it is, what does this mean? And what must I do? Because we have the chance to breathe life on the gold that is in people. And we want to do that. We want to choose well. We want to choose wisely. Okay. Um, the, the next thing um, that the Lord has put on my heart is to really encourage you to be about your father's business. Because once again, in Ephesians 2.10, he has written out good works for you to walk in. Be about your father's business. Then the next thing that really, really hit my heart was this. Um, the Lord gives us great examples to look to in the Bible. And a lot of them started out really well but they didn't develop the integrity that they might have. And in the end, they made some poor choices. And I just feel that it's important for us to really allow God to develop integrity within us because he doesn't want the dream that he gave each of us to crush us. He wants us to be able to carry that dream forward so that it can be birthed and it can come to life and his kingdom can expand. And, you know, a great example is Trina. He gave her that dream nine years ago. And shes it's now coming off the ground. It's now coming to fruition. And, and I, I believe there's a great opportunity for us too to partner with her because in the birthing of this school, Flight Deck, there's been a partnership that has been established to allow us access to the videos that Bethel has to offer. And that partnership involves a monthly commitment and so we have the opportunity of sewing into that because each person who is a student in this school is going to bear much fruit. So that's a good field to sew into. So sit with the Lord and see what he suggests, because I believe that we each have the opportunity to be generous with what he's given us. Freely we received, freely we give. And we have the opportunity to choose where we store up our treasure in heaven. And what better place than a school that's teaching people how to live their lives with integrity so that the kingdom can be advanced and they can walk in the fullness of what Jesus accomplished for them on the cross. What better place? field to sow into. <clears throat> uh, we need to fully surrender to his plan because he sees all the different details and he sees the way all of these plans go together to make a really tight kingdom that cannot be broken. He sees 
the relationships that he wants us to cultivate so that we can link arms with the ones who are to walk with us. He sees how it is that he would have us grow, how it is that he would have us develop our gifts and our talents, how it is that he would have us reflect his son. And those are all of the opportunities, not all of them actually, those are some of the opportunities that we have because of who he is and because of how good he is and how much he loves us. So <clears throat> we have this great opportunity to partner with Father God each and every day when we get up. And it starts by us surrendering to him, by us cultivating our ear to hear, by us spending time with him, by us looking upon him, by us entering into the rest of him. That's the part of him that we haven't yet explored. And so that's the invitation, I feel. The invitation is for now. The invitation is for everyone. The invitation is current and its future. And the important thing is to not get bogged down by what we see around us, but instead learn how to see things from his perspective. Catch me up, Lord. Help me to see from your perspective. Help me to partner with you so that your kingdom is brought forth. Help me to cultivate the gifts and talents that you have given me. And help me to live my life well as a surrendered vessel that you can fill with your living water and Jesus can turn that into the new wine that can be poured out to invite others to your kingdom banquet celebrating the marriage of the Lamb. Help me to be the bride of Christ. Help me to be that Proverbs 31 woman. And I, I encourage you to read that because in that proverb, it's telling us what are the virtues of the bride of Christ. So I encourage you to look at that. I encourage you to consider, consider King David, who even though he was known for having the heart after God, he didn't allow himself to be transformed as fully as he might have. And in the end, made some poor choices that prevented him from completing his destiny and prevented him from honoring God the way he wanted to honor him. Consider that and consider that his son Solomon, although he chose well in the beginning, the sins of the father came down through him and he didn't have a problem with just one woman. He had a problem with thousands of women and he compromised his life. And he didn't end well. But God remembers him as the one with the greatest wisdom. God always remembers us as he made us to be, which is very refreshing and very encouraging. However, I want to do my best to end well. Jonah. Jonah had the gift as an evangelist. But when he was tasked by the Lord, he ran away. He's like, I, I don't want to go to those guys. I don't want them to be saved. Quite frankly, I don't think they should clutter up heaven. Quite frankly, I know that if I go there, you will save them. And I know that I don't want them to be saved. So he got on a ship and he went somewhere else. Well, what happened? The wrath of the Lord caused a big storm and all the people on the ship, Jonah was sleeping. He was asleep. People on the ship are like, what's going on? And they wake him up. And he goes, oh, it's probably the Lord. I ran away. Well, what should we do? Well, just throw me over. Uh, okay. So they throw him over and they see that the storm stops. And what happens? They get saved. They give their lives to the Lord. So this guy's heart isn't even in the right place, yet his gift is making a way for him. Big fish comes along, swallows him up, takes him the other way spits him up on shore. He gives the message he was supposed to give and people get saved. An entire city, 600,000 people, they get saved. Jonah was not happy. God had a, a few words for him, you know? So 
So our gift will make a way for us. But the question is, is how do we position our hearts towards the Lord so that he can continue to fill us with his love so that our cup runneth over, our hearts runneth over, and others are impacted by him, not us, but by him. That's what we need to do. That's the way to do it. Consider Gideon. Gideon heard from the Lord. Gideon saw the Lord. Read about it in Judges. When you read about it, it it's Judges, I think it's like seven and eight. And when you read about it, there's places where it says the angel of the Lord. And then there's places where it says the Lord. So Gideon saw the Lord face to face. He talked with him. He interacted with him. And then he tested it to make sure it was really him. So, okay, that's fine. God's okay with that. He's big enough. But when you finally get your marching orders, go with the Lord. Because that way you know you're going to win. So the Lord takes his men down from like 300,000 down to 300. And he says, this is how they're going to know it was me. Not you, but me. And, and Gideon wins. And he, he leads his men and all sorts of um, victories are had. And in the end, he requires all of the golden earrings and the ornaments off of the camels of the two kings who he has finally defeated. And he takes all that and he melts it down and he makes a golden ephod which is a breastplate, and he mounts it in the city of Orpra, which is where he is now, where he lives. But it says that he, um, he, he totally kind of blew it because he didn't end up um, well. Because what happened was, um, let's see what ended up happening was that, um, his people played the harlot with, um, that ephod and here we go. Um, it's, um, judges eight twenty seven. place it in a city, Ophrah and all Israel played the harlot with it there so that it became a snare to Gideon and his household. So the challenge is we want to surround ourselves with good counselors and people who will serve as iron sharpening iron because we want to end well. And we want to allow the refiner's fire to remove any of the impurities that are in us. So that's where I'm going to end today. And I hope that you have a great day and that you share the thoughts that you get from this teaching. And, you know, I just, I, I what I really like to do is I like to try to spark discussion. Um, for homework, I would like for people to take a look at some of the people within the Bible and just think about, okay, here's how they started out. They started well, and then they didn't really finish so well. And I'm not saying that that's the case with everybody. I'm just saying, let's learn what we can from the Bible. Let's read it with an eye towards, Lord, what are you trying to tell me for my life with this story? And how is it that I can submit myself to you to be more effective in your hands in Jesus name? Okay, have a great day.